Uh, I like reading. Uh, Reading is terrific. Uh, More than reading, I like good writing because good writing helps you understand the story. If, If you've got a good author, they can actually transport you to the place. Uh, I like reading at the moment a guy called Gary Disher. Uh, He writes uh, Australian detective novels. And in the space of a sentence, he can make you feel like you're standing in the dust, smelling eucalypt in the air. Just use a couple of words. He does it brilliantly. Uh, A good author can also give you a feel for the people. Uh, I liked reading a book uh, when I was at Bible college called Running with the Buffaloes. It'll mean nothing to anyone about the University of Colorado cross-country team in 1998. Scintillating topic, hey? Uh, But when I read it, I felt like I was on their training runs. Uh, I felt like I could hear the breathing and feel the sweat of the people around me. That's what good words can do. Uh, Sometimes a good author can take you back to a time that's not your own, to culture and custom that seems strange, and you can feel like you're, you're sitting at a meal and you can almost taste it as it's brought out. I, I kind of like the way Tolkien does that, as he sits you at feasts with dwarves and elves, and you can almost, I've never tasted mead, but I think I've drunk it just by reading the books. A, a good author can use a few words just to help you understand a why, or a what happened, or a, a reason. <laughs> Ian Rankin writes about a detective called Rebus based in Edinburgh. Never been to Edinburgh. Don't know what the city's like, but I feel like I know why the city ticks that way because of the way Ian Rankin writes. A good writing will transport you, won't it? It'll place you in a scene. You can almost feel the breeze and the smells and the tastes. At school, it was reduced for a bloke like me to something really simple. Uh, you'll see it there on your outline, who, what, when, where, and why. If you're going to write something, at least cover those bases. Uh, I was never a good writer, uh, but that was kind of like my basic jigsaw pattern for putting together a piece of writing, who, what, when, where, and why. Now, the Bible is good literature, isn't it? The Bible is good literature. It's a mix of literature from history to poetry to song to letters to good news proclamations. And all of those aspects we've just looked at in that really simplified form, who, what, when, where, and why, are really useful when you open up a book called Haggai. Haggai is probably not a book many of us have read regularly. It's kind of in the dark ages of the Bible, kind of a part of the Bible we don't often turn to, but the authors are sensational. The literature takes you there. And it's a book we need to listen to because... This is our people. This is our mob. So as we come to the book of Haggai, we're going to use those basic categories today. Who, what, when, where. We're going to do why next week. And we're going to start to immerse ourselves in this book and understand what God is going to say to us today and over the next few weeks. Let me pray, and then we're going to read the first verse. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks that we can sit here and open it. Uh, Your word's been discussed a lot this week, Father, in the national debate. Father, there has been much said that has shown that people don't understand your word. They don't know where it fits. They don't know its relevance. Uh, Father, we could be tempted to float along with that narrative today. But, Father, please stop us. In this first verse... Please start to transport us to that time of Haggai so we can understand our people, uh, our place in your story, and more importantly, your place in your story. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, turn with me to the book of Haggai, page 439. Uh, We're going to read the first verse and then we're going to dive in and look at some of the parts of this. Haggai, chapter 1, verse 1, page 439. In 839, there you go. It's great having sausage fingers. That's my excuse. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Good literature doesn't use many words. 
It can use a minimum number of words to put you in a place. It can use a small number of words to take you to a street or a time or a song or a meal. It can sometimes be as simple as just telling you the date. Haggai chooses that simple and clear method. Did you pick it up there? In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month. When? Well, we've got the date there. In fact, the dates are repeated a number of times. Chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 14. Chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 20. King Darius is the third ruler of the new Persian Empire. He came to power in 522 BC. He succeeded Cambyses. Can you go to the next slide, please? Who ruled Persia from 530 BC to 22 BC. Cambyses died tragically at his own hand. We're told it might have been as simple as peeling some fruit with a sharp knife and he cut himself. The first ruler of Persia had been Cyrus. We've heard about him today, haven't we? Cyrus, who after two decades of war and violence, marched into Babylon and said, there's a new king in town, and he rules Persia in 539 BC. The Persian Empire replaced the Babylonian Empire, replaced the Assyrian Empire. If you're thinking where we are at the moment, we're talking the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, around about Israel. Under the Assyrian Empire, as we've been reminded earlier on, the northern kingdom of God's people, ten tribes called Israel, have been taken into exile in 722 BC. That event's described in 2 Kings 17. If you're looking at that map, uh, we're where that black line goes up and suddenly stops. They had chosen not to follow God. The southern kingdom, Judah, based around Jerusalem with two tribes, had watched what had happened just over the border, had seen the violence. If you're on the border, you could have smelt the smoke. And they'd chosen to ignore that warning of Assyria. They'd chosen to ignore all the people that God said, come back to me, people like Isaiah and Jeremiah. They'd refuse to listen. They'd refuse to obey. They'd sunk further into disobedience. And in 597, 587 BC, they were taken away by Babylon, 2 Kings 21. By the waters of Babylon, God's mob wept. By the waters of Babylon, God's mob were warned by a man called Ezekiel. In Babylon, God's people learn what are meant to be God's people. That's the book of Daniel. In Babylon, God's people were judged. Cyrus comes to power in 539 BC. Next slide, please, Baxter. And when Cyrus comes to power in 539 BC, we're at the left-hand end, He brings in a new policy for the whole empire. Uh, Assyria and Babylon had specialised in terror, destruction, removal, depletion. Cyrus, who's described in Isaiah 45 verse 1 as God's Messiah, he's the first Messiah, he actually passes a law that says to God's people, go home. Says to all the nations, go home. Go back to your own patch of dirt. And that's what we read about in Ezra chapter 1. In fact, when Cyrus says, go home, he says, take our money with you. Take our gold, take our silver, take our wood. Off you go and rebuild your homeland. We read about that in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. And so God's people do decide to return. It's not a big number, 13,000, maybe 20 at the outside edge. It's not a big group of people, is it? Remember when they left Egypt? (laughs) Or over a million. How many come back? Oh, just a little bit larger than our district. They come back to the land. Slide three. Their return was in 539 BC. Haggai is written 19 years later. Darius has succeeded Cambyses, who succeeded Cyrus. That's the journey, Babylon to Jerusalem. 
That's the journey they made. And it takes place in the second year of Darius. We're in 520 BC. In fact, the dates are so specific, August 29, 520 BC is when Haggai first speaks. And all of Haggai takes place over four months. He's done by Christmas, if they had Christmas back then. So what is Haggai all about? I'm at point two on the outline. The word of the Lord came through. What we have in our hands is the word of the Lord. Did you think that when you opened Haggai? I'm opening up the word of the Lord. I'm opening up God's revelation about himself. In simpler terms, what we have in our hands is called prophecy. Uh, Even in those few words, the word of the Lord came through. We have all the hallmarks of prophecy. This is how you can smell a prophet, hear a prophet, identify a prophet. First, whose word is it? Is it Haggai's? That's not Haggai's word, is it? Uh, Haggai's completely unoriginal. He's very conservative. It's God's word. It's the word of the Lord. All prophecy is the word of the Lord. All prophecy is the word of the Lord. It's God's specific revelation. Second, it's from God to who? Now, we'll deal with a specific who later on. But did you notice the word for God there? Just look in your Bibles. It'll be in capitals, Lord. It's God's personal name, God's relational name. It's a name that God gives to his mob to talk to him, to listen to him. This is his covenant people. Remember God chose a bloke called Abram? Uh, We've spent four years with Abraham and his family. We're now down to Jacob. And God said, through your mob, I'm going to save the world. I'm going to deal with what? What's what's the world's big problem? It's sin. I'm going to reverse sin. I'm going to take brokenness and make it blessedness. In fact, God's so committed to this that he makes a covenant with Abraham's mob. It's made with Abraham and then it's confirmed on Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 to 20. God takes all the burden of the commitment, doesn't he? That's his kindness. And God's people respond there. Abraham does it and they do at Mount Sinai and says, we'll obey you, God. Our job is to reflect you to the world. We, we have your image, so we're going to be your image bearers. And God gives them laws, and by obeying those laws, they show God to the world. What's God's like? God's God like? God's faithful. God's not adulterous. God tells the truth. God doesn't steal. God isn't covetous. That's God. And they commit to showing him to the world. Well, by the very fact that they're not in the land and coming back to it, we we know what kind of job they did. And so whenever God sends a prophet, it's God's word to his mob saying, come back to me. You're my mob. You're my people. You've got to reflect me to the world. And when God does that, it always comes through someone. Uh, We'll deal with this person in a second. But that's what we've got in our hands, the word of God to God's mob saying, come back, come back, come back. Well, who did it come through? To whom was it spoken? I'm at point three on the outline. The word of the Lord came through Haggai. That's all we know. Oh, we know what his name means. It means festivals. And one of the ironic things about the whole book is that every time he speaks, it's at a festival. Specific festivals for God's people. He's mentioned in Ezra, Ezra chapter 5 verse 1 and chapter 6 verse 14. In Ezra, he's described as a prophet. That's all we got. Haggai. And it came to two people. Did you notice them there in verse 1? Zerubbabel and Joshua. We're given their job descriptions, aren't we? Did you notice their jobs? Zerubbabel is the governor of that small little province they've come back to. And Joshua, he's the high priest. It's striking that God speaks to the leaders, doesn't he? He speaks to the leaders. In fact, we've got all three leaders of God's people here, don't we? We've got a prophet, we've got a priest, and we've got a king. It's like some bad joke, isn't it? A prophet, a priest, and a king. 
In fact, it's the reversal of why God's people went away because the prophets and the priests and the kings didn't lead God's people. Just read about it in Jeremiah 22. They all failed. The prophets were false. The priests were corrupt. The kings were bad shepherds. And so God's people were led astray. Zerubbabel and Joshua were part of the original returnees. You can go and read that list of returnees in Ezra 2. There are their names. They'd been in the land for 19 years. And this is the first time a prophet has spoken to them. Can you imagine how their tummies felt when Haggai turned up and said, I've got a word from the Lord for you guys. As the rubble, we have a few more details about. If you look at Jesus' family tree in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke 3, you'll find Zerubbabel. That tells you his family tree. Who's he descended from? He's descended from David. So he might just be a governor of a tin pot Persian province, but he's actually in David's line, which is really important in this book. And Joshua, he's the high priest. He's got a very clear job. Rebuild the temple. So where are they? Baxter, can you go to the next slide, mate? Where are they? It's important to get a sense of the geography. This is in your Bible study booklets. It's important to get a sense of where these people are. We've been told where they are, haven't we? We've been told they're in Judah, and we've been told that if they're in Judah and you've got a high priest, you're probably hanging out around Jerusalem. They're in the land God promised them. Ezra tells you the full story of their return. Go, Go and read Ezra. But when they were removed from the land, it wasn't just heartbreaking because they lost their homes. It wasn't just heartrending because they lost their crops. It wasn't just disappointing because they lost the war. They lost the temple. They lost the temple. It's a really big, concrete, literally picture in the middle of your capital city that tells you something about God. That's why we had the reading that Phil brought us from the book of Kings. At first, the temple is, well, it looks like a house. It's a really flash house. It's a house designed by God to very clear instructions with very specific rooms and interior decoration, but it's a house nonetheless. And it's a house in the middle of the capital of the city of the people of God that says, I want to live with you. I want you to come into my house. I want you to hang out with me because I want to hang out with you. And if you listen carefully to the reading that Phil gave us, in that house dwells God's name. This is who God is. God is the God who wants to hang out with his image bearers. No matter what they look like, no matter where they're from, God wants to hang out with his mob. But the second part of that picture is the problem of hanging out, isn't it? Because God's people can't just rock up any time. What happens there in the heart of this house, if you like, in the kitchen? Well, things get killed, don't they? Your best breeding stock, the top line of your crops get burnt because there is a problem with God dwelling with his mob, isn't there? It's that problem that God committed to dealing with when he had a chat with Abraham. It's the problem of sin, isn't it? For God to dwell with his people, This thing called sin must be dealt with. What's sin? Sin's the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not. Sin's the attitude and action that says, that's my house. Not your house. That's my house. And I'll decide whether you can hang out with me, God. Imagine the pride that goes into that. God wants to deal with that sin. God doesn't have to deal with that sin, but out of his kindness, his grace, and his mercy, he says, I want you to hang out with me. I want you to be my mob, and so I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to give you a system, a a, a picture language of how serious this problem is and how it needs to be dealt with. How serious is this problem? It's so serious 
that if you stay in sin, you are separated from God. You need something to step in and take that for you. And how will that happen? When something without a mark or a blemish dies for you. So can you imagine losing your temple? Can I ever hang out with God again? Does God even want me in his house? Is God making promises he doesn't want to keep? Is God leading me down the garden path and raising my hopes and then dashing them? How's my sin going to be dealt with? I mean, where's my breeding stock in Babylon? Where do I go to sacrifice this animal? How am I ever going to hang out in God's house ever again? So it's not just about losing your land, is it? It's not just about losing your house. It's not just about losing the war. It's losing your life. It's losing your reason. And you had taken those things for granted, hadn't you? Hanging out with God, having your sin dealt with. You treated them lightly. You'd use them as an insurance policy kept on the back shelf in case you did something wrong. And now you've lost it. The land has been destroyed. The temple has been reduced. Your society has been completely depleted. And now you come back in dribs and draps. And the reason you came back is in Ezra chapter 1 verse 5 to rebuild the Lord's house in Jerusalem. Cyrus, of all people, that Persian with all that blood on his hands, he said, go home. In fact, take our resources. And so you went home, that group of people. And when you came home, you laid the foundation stone. And then when you did, the opponents came out and they attacked you. They used the apparatus of the state to write letters and slow you down. They spread rumours about you in the local media. They laughed at you. They beat up on you in the playground. They responded with aggression and violence. The project began, but it stopped because it, it really is just too hard. It is just too difficult. The dreams are now in black and white, not in colour. The landscape is grey. There are too many other alternatives. And so in Ezra chapter 4, verse 23, the Jews stopped building the temple. That's where we are. That's the land. I'm at the last point on the outline. Who would have thought you could get that much out of one verse? It's not many words, is it? It's even less in the Hebrew. But he's taken us in, hasn't he? Taken us into the land, 520 BC, August 29, Darius rules Persia. We're in Jerusalem with the remnant of God's people who've returned 19 years earlier. Haggai is speaking the word of the Lord. He's speaking to Zerubbabel, the local political leader who's descended from David. He's talking with Joshua, who's meant to be rebuilding the temple. We're in a landscape that is not what we hoped for. The rebuilding of the temple stopped over a decade ago. We have opponents. We've got crop worries. We're worried about the ceilings of our own homes. We face significant pressure and our focus has changed. And God speaks. I don't know how many of us have been to Babylon, even to Israel. So it's quite a foreign landscape, isn't it? But on another level, it's quite familiar, isn't it? Think think about last week. Last week, the CEO of one of the nation's largest football clubs had to decide which house to build, didn't he? Did you think about it like that? We live in a climate where mentions of God are accompanied by insults and people like David Koch saying, get with the times. We live in a nation where two decades ago the people of God were the good guys and now we're the bad guys. Is it really a different place? Many of us are fearful, aren't we? 
when we look at our lives as God's people. Many of us wonder where God is. The landscape doesn't look colourful. It looks grey. Many of us wonder whether God has given us promises that have led us down the garden path, raised our hopes, said, I'll be with you always, and now he seems so far away. Is he really committed? And that's not even dealing with questions like sin. Is it really that sinful too? I mean, look at the times we live in. Do we really want to build that house? Many of us are stalled in the building of God's house, aren't we? We're worn down by opposition. We're distracted by the alternatives for our time, our energy, our desires. How guys, remarkably 2022, isn't it? The word of the Lord came through Haggai in real time, in real space, in real geography, to real people with a real problem. Does it sound like something worth listening to? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for Haggai. Uh, Over the space of four months, you used this man to speak a message about the building of your house and then he disappears but your word doesn't father it's here in front of us it's in our hands but father please transport it to our hearts and our minds please place it in the center of the house that we build so that many will know that you are not distant that we can come to you that we can dwell with you with our sins forgiven forever. Amen.